An English prince in his boyhood, closely related to the York family, he would have inherited the crown. Instead, another relative secured the throne. The prince and his younger brother were put under royal custody and ultimately even imprisoned. It sounds like the introduction to a video about the princess in the tower actually concerns Edmund Mortimer the fifth Earl of March, who would have inherited the crown from Richard II if Henry IV of the House of Lancaster had not secured it. The parallels and connections are not limited to what has been described so far. The whereabouts of Edmund's younger brother Roger, the one who was imprisoned with him, is unclear. The House of York traced its claim to primacy over the Lancaster kings directly to Edmund. Richard of York, who started the Wars of the Roses, was the nephew of the prevented king. That's why I was even tempted to call this video the other princess in the tower. But that was too much clickbait for me, even for me. Primarily because they weren't even locked in the tower. But this story, which is far too often untold, is still really exciting. However, there's a problem. The same names appear again and again and again in the English ruling dynasty. This can make understanding very complicated. I will therefore try to keep this as simple as possible and limit myself to the most important names. But if this is still too complicated and or unimportant for you, I will now show you the timestamp of when the actual story begins. Edmund Mortimer was born in Ireland on November 6, 1391, as the first son of Roger Mortimer and Eleanor Holland. His paternal great-grandfather was Edward III's second-born son Lionel of Adverb. Here you go with complicated names. Lionel only had one daughter, Philippa of Clarence, who married the grandfather of the Prince of Our Story. Edmund was also related to King Edward I through his mother. Edmund's maternal great-grandmother, Joan of Kent, was the mother of Richard II. Edmund was therefore Richard's half-grandnephew. As long as the king had no children, the Mortimer line was the heir to the throne via the connection with Lionel of Antwerp. When Edmund was born, his father Roger was Richard's successor. However, he died on July 20th, 1398. Edmund was not even seven years old when he became crown prince himself. There were therefore discussions about the succession. However, Richard ensured that this remained unchanged. He felt that his successor would still be a minor for a long time as a way of securing his own power. After Richard's own minority, no one wanted to do it again. To some extent, Richard was right. Henry IV needed an act of parliament to legitimize his rise to power. The official reason why he was entitled to the crown was shaky at best. Edmund Mortimer had no unbreaking male line of ancestors to Edward III. Philippa of Clarence disqualified Edmund as heir in comparison with him, who was related to Edward III through his father John of Gaunt, argued Henry IV. Henry himself knew that this argument from the House of Lancaster was weak. After all, Edmund's line had been recognized as heir without any problems before he seized the crown, and the problem was made worse by Edmund's sister Anne marrying into the York line. This one was also directly related to Edward III, only through men. It went back to Edmund Langley, the fourth son of Edward III. So in case I still have viewers after this complicated part, let me describe what happened next. Henry certainly believed that Edmund and his brother Roger would have posed too great a threat to his rule. He therefore had them guarded by Thur, Hugh, Waterton at Windsor and Berkhamsted. However, they were treated honorably here and were temporarily raised with two of Henry's children. The princes, two sisters, were less lucky so. They were left virtually penniless. As early as 1402 it became clear that the Lancaster king was right in his assumption that Edmund could become a threat to his rule. 
Prince's uncle was captured by the Welsh rebel leader Owen Glendower. However, the king assumed that Mortimer had defected and betrayed him. The monarch therefore confiscated Mortimer's possessions. Mortimer in return married Glendower's daughter and proclaimed his nephew Edmund the actual king. A year later, Edmund's aunt, along with her husband, Henry Percy, known under the beautiful name Harry Hotspur, also rebelled in Edmund's favor, but these two were defeated. Things got dramatic in February 1405. The Welsh and Edmund's uncle decided to free the princess from Windsor. They bribed the blacksmith to copy the keys to the castle. The actual liberation was successful, but a short time later Henry's men were able to capture them. Co-conspirator Constance of York heavenly incriminated her brother, who was therefore imprisoned in Pevensey Castle for 17 weeks. This fate also awaited the two princes. On February the 1st, 1406, they were transferred to the heavily secured facility and placed under the supervision of Sir John Pelham. As long as Henry IV lived, they were never to leave the castle again. Roger may have died here in 1409. Officially, the future Henry V was given oversight of the princess in the same year. In fact, it was probably his father who made it clear that release was out of question. When Henry V became king in 1413, he released Edmund from prison, even though rebellions in his favor were still expected. It can be assumed that the two men had a personal friendship. On April 8, 1413, Henry also made Edmund a member of the Knights of the Bath Order. Surprisingly, Roger's name also appears again in this regard, which is also recorded. If this is true, he was apparently still alive at the time, but there is no other evidence of this. An alternative theory would be maybe it was a post-mortem honor. Edmund, who was allowed to keep his family's possessions, even while in custody, expressed his desire to marry. Uh, Henry and his wife didn't like the idea. Henry V had delegated this question to his wife before his accession to the throne. However, his spouse did not want to look for a wife for Edmund and gave the task back, and there it was sitting and nothing happened. After his release, Edmund had to take care of the courtship himself. He obtained a papal dispense to marry a person with whom he was related in the third degree. He chose his cousin Anne of Stafford, who came from a wealthy family and was also a descendant of Edward III. Henry V was not happy with this. He imposed a very high fine of 10,000 marks on Edmund because of this marriage. It was the only time that the relationship between the two men got into trouble. However, Edmund remained loyal and was one of the king's most trusted advisors. Not only was he present when Henry's council decided to go to war with France, but he was also one of the witnesses to the king's will. His friends and even some of his confessors urged him to reach for the crown. How little inclination Edmund had for this became apparent in the summer of 1415 as part of the so-called Southampton plot. Some nobles, led by Edmund's brother-in-law, wanted to bring him to Wales and proclaim him king. Edmund revealed the conspiracy to the king on July 31st, 1415. His brother-in-law, the father of Richard of York, and other conspirators were beheaded a few days later. Henry issued a general pardon for Edmund for anything connected with the conspiracy on August 7th, 1415. Anyone who has seen the Netflix film King, which is based on the Shakespeare play about Henry V, Edmund's role is completely missing here. It is interesting that in modern times there has been a debate about whether Edmund made the confession under coercion. One of his dependents, named Lucy, was one of the conspirators. However, Edmund was part of the commission that subsequently sentenced the conspirators to death. In France, Edmund, who was deeply in private debt at the time, was one of the king's most reliable and loyal captains. Together with Henry, he traveled back to England for the monarch's wedding to Catherine of Valois. At the queen's coronation, he was allowed to carry the first scepter, which was a special honor. Henry V then set off again for France, 
and Edmund was at his side again. And this also applies to the moment when Henry V died. Back in England, Edmund was appointed to the Privy Council, which was supposed to support the regents during Henry V's minority. This quickly paid off for Edmund, as he, like many of his ancestors, was appointed Lieutenant of Ireland. Almost as quickly, however, he clashed with the regent Humphrey, the Duke of Gloucester. According to chronicle reports, the Duke was jealous of Edmund long before that moment. The situation escalated through John Mortimer. He was a cousin or an illegitimate uncle of Edmund. John was imprisoned as a traitor but escaped in 1422. He was not caught and executed until 1424. Humphrey suspected that John had help from Edmund, or it was simply a welcome opportunity for the regent to take Edmund out of the game and send him to Ireland. Edmund arrived here in the fall of 1424 but died of the plague on January 19th, 1425. He had no children, which is why the line of the Earls of March, which once began with Roger Mortimer, the lover of King Isabella, wife of Edward II, died out with him. As mentioned, his inheritance passed to Richard of York. In the Chronicles, Edmund is viewed quite positively. For example, he was described as the good one by reason of his exceeding kindness. The Wigman Chronicle describes the man who also founded the college in Suffolk as severe in his morals, composed in his act, circumspect in his talk, and wise and cautious during the days of his adversity. Our picture of him, however, is heavenly influenced of the many misrepresentations that Shakespeare made about him. For example, he wasn't an old man in the tower. This is probably one of the reasons why his story does not attract as much interest in our time as many others from the English ruling dynasty. But hey, maybe there's change.